do not think work is a material thing and not important. Look at it as a godly thing and do it as unto God so that through your work, the image of God shines forth in this world. People say, be a testimony. Your work is a way that you can be a testimony before the world. The kind of products you produce, the kind of service you give, the kind of work you do is a testimony that there is a God who's a good God. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. The image and likeness of God given to him relates to the work, the kind of work, the nature of work that God has given to him. 
because of the nature of work, such a lofty work, such a high class work, such a work where he really dominates everything and determines everything and decides everything, removes all chaos, emptiness and darkness, makes everything function well. That is the nature of the work. That is why the image of God was given to him and the likeness of God was given to him because he can bring about positive change in any situation. So, whatever profession you are in, you are doing that kind of job. You are an agent of change. You are, you are fixing things that are broken. A doctor is fixing the body that is not functioning well. He's doing the work of God. If God works, that's what he will do. So, no doctor should think, well, I'm not a preacher and I'm not a... Don't aspire to be a preacher. You can preach by being a doctor better than, you, you know, a preacher can preach, basically. And to the kind of audience that probably will never come into a church and listen. By your work, by the sincere effort that you make and by the expert work that you do, by all the knowledge and everything that you have at your disposal, when you do your work, well, and you do it for the glory of God, that shows the image of God to the world. People see that. In James chapter 3, verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Not, it's talking about how you cannot tame a man's tongue. You can tame everything, but not the man's tongue, you know. Only God can do it. And uh, he's making a very important uh, uh, point here. He says, every beast, every bird, every reptile, every creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed. Shows that man has been exercising authority, a God kind of authority over all the creatures. Now, <laughs> so man is given a specific work to do. And all our work, whatever profession you are in, small or great, whatever it is, it has, it is directly related to that work of ruling. And that ruling has to do with fixing chaos, emptiness, and darkness. That's how it works. The close association in verse 26 of the statement about how, about how man is made in the image and likeness of God and how he is to rule. And then immediately the rule is explained as subduing and dominating in verse 28. Shows that man's image and likeness is to enable him to do the rule of this kind and do the work of this, that kind. And whatever work we do relates to that. Whether you're a mechanic, painter, you are an a engineer, a computer man, or whatever it is, you are always removing some chaos, emptiness, and darkness, bringing something under your control so that it can function well. And therefore, every job is important. Every job is important. I told you last Sunday that uh, all the kings uh, made uh, their statues and put them all over the, their domain because some of the areas where they ruled, they never went, people never saw him. So they wanted to make sure that they knew who ruled. So what was the image all about? They, they made their image and placed them there in the city square or some important place so that everybody can see. So everybody has, has in one way seen the king at least in that image. And I told you last Sunday that God didn't place images, he placed human beings, living human beings, to represent him all over the world, instead of placing images, people made in the image and likeness of God. But the image of God that uh, people saw, you know what it represented? When they saw that image, they respected that image, the village people, the town people. They've never seen the king, but they'll bow before that image, and they'll garland that image. They'll pay respects to that image. You know why? Because that image, showed who is in authority, under who they are functioning, and who has power and authority over them, who will protect them, who will feed them, who will take care of them, protect them from their image. The image meant a lot to them. That's what the image meant. So they paid a lot of respect. They knew that it is a symbol of his presence and power. That's what the image was all about. Now we are the image of God. God didn't put statues. 
And when people see us, they must see the presence of God and the authority and the power of God through us. That's how God wants us to convert our work in this world into our work, our business, and our enterprise, our profession must reflect God's image. People who have, that have never seen God must say, that's God, that's godly, that's good. This is what God would be like, you know. People must see that. Now, in those days, when the Bible was written in the biblical times, there was countries like Egypt and the areas like Mesopotamia and all that. In those places, only the king's image was put up. And the, and the, and the king's image to, meant to people that he's almost equal to God. You know, they looked at kings as God appointed. So they paid the same kind of respect they'll pay to God, to the king. This is the whole idea in the ancient world. They treated the king like a God's representative. That's what it meant to them. The, that he is God's representative. But the Bible does not teach that only a few, a very few people, uh, you know, carried the image of God. The Bible does not say, teach that only a few people are like kings, they have authority and they carry the image of God. You know how the Bible teaches? The Bible says that man, that includes every one of us, you and I, all kinds of people everywhere, no matter what caste, what color, what nationality, whatever background you come from, man. God said, let us make a man in our image and in our likeness. God did not just make kings as images of himself. He made man, every man, every last man as his image and his likeness. That's the Bible. Hello. The concept of the king being in the image of God is ancient concept. But more ancient than that, more established than that by God is this concept that every man is in the image of God. Every man is in the image of God. So when you go home, look at yourself in the mirror. You are the image of God, not just come some king of the country. You are the image of God. Secondly, work has dignity. Not just some work, but all work has dignity. All kinds of work have dignity. <laughs> Let me quickly say this. In Genesis chapter 2, we read in verse 8 about God making a garden for Adam. It says, God literally planted a garden. Have you ever read that? God planted a garden. 2.8. God planted a garden. Here God, in the very first chapters of the Bible, presenting himself as a gardener. Hello. And we think gardener is a cheap thing, you know. Let's call some gardener, pay him three, four hundred rupees a day. He'll come and do the gardening. You know, that, that's a cheap kind of job. And we'll never get our hands dirty sometimes, you know. God presents himself as a gardener, planted a garden. And then in the New Testament, you come to the New Testament, you know, if you ask the Greeks of that time, if God ever came into the world as a man, how would he come? What kind of form he will take? They'll say, well, he'll come as a great philosopher, a brainy guy, you know who can uh, talk about anything and so on, he'll be a philosopher king. And Romans would have said, well, he'll be a noble statesman. You know, that's their concept of a, a God, you know. And Jesus came, his word made flesh, he's God in flesh, and he came as a carpenter. So all carpenters sit up straight. <laughs> this is how God presents himself. That shows that in the sight of God, every job has dignity. Every job has dignity. Think of the person that's sweeping the floor, sweeping our house. Sometimes we pay people to do that. You know, the thing is, if they don't show up, which they oftentimes don't, you know, right? What happens? We ourselves get to sweeping and mopping. Why? Because you can't live in the dirt if you lived long enough. In the dirt, then you will be living no more. Some infection will come, some germs will get into you, you get killed by all these things. So you want to get down and scrub the floor, get it clean. 
I lived as a bachelor for many years. I cleaned. First, I remember the first time I cooked, I put, left all the stuff in the kitchen sink. Sit, let it sit there till tomorrow. I cooked and ate, and I was so tired, and I got to clean it myself. I left it there, and then it started stinking. I couldn't stand it. So I cleaned it. I learned how to clean. Wash pots and pans, you know. Cleaned it. And then I started cleaning it as soon as I ate. Because you got to keep it clean. Somebody may come, you know. You can't have servants there. Now, was that bad? Is that a demeaning job? Is that something that we shy away from? If they don't come, we do it. That shows that it is in no way demeaning. If you can do it, and if the other person can also do it, then it is a respectable job. It is not something bad. It is not something, uh, you know, that <laughs> takes you down in status or something like that. Thirdly, work has dignity because the material creation was called, uh, the material creation that we are called to take care of and to administer is good, called as good and very good by God. Totally opposite of the, Jew, uh, the Greeks thinking. They called it bad, God called it good. The thing, the world that we are supposed to take care of is good, according to the Bible. They said material is bad, spiritual is good. But look at the doctrine of incarnation, the coming of Christ into the world. Word became flesh. Immediately the Greeks say, oh, that's bad. How can God become flesh? This became a big controversy in the first century. If God became flesh, then he will lose his godliness by becoming flesh. If he took on human flesh, then how can he remain God? And you, you know, the Hebrews had no problem with that. But, you know, they have other problems. Like, you know, the, the God is one and uh, God doesn't have a son and all these things they have. But, the, you know, they don't have problem with human body, you know, being bad or anything like that. But the Greeks had a real problem. So they started bringing the, 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 those kinds of ideas like Jesus appeared like he was in the flesh, but he was not really there. He was some kind of a ghost-like thing. All these ideas spread in the world at that time because they just could not believe how God can take on human flesh. That's because human flesh is believed to be bad. But God comes in incarnation in flesh, takes upon himself a human body. And when they kill him and bury that human body, and when we die, when, they, when he got killed and buried, God raised up that body. And his resurrection is proof that our bodies also will be raised one day. When they bury us in the ground, people that bury us may forget us. But God who redeemed, our, redeemed us has redeemed our body also. He has paid for it. He has fully paid for it and he's coming to get it. And when the trumpet sounds and the, with the angels of God, Jesus descends from heaven, the dead in Christ will rise first, the Bible says. Oh, graves will be opened and people buried there will come out, the Bible says. Nothing wrong with the body. God is interested in the body. He's the owner of the body. The body is for the Lord, 1 Corinthians 6 says. Body is for the Lord. It belongs to the Lord. Why did God create a body? So that it can become the temple of God. So God is coming for it. This is the way the Bible teaches it. Totally opposite of what the Greeks thought. They thought it's bad. But the Bible says it's good. Plus, Christians think that the earth is basically a... a Basically, we are here temporarily on this earth and it's like a theater where we display our individual salvation stories here. And after our life is over here, we'll go away and live in disembodied bodies. Without body, we will live somewhere else, kind of floating like angels, you know. This is the kind of picture some Christians have. We'll be in heaven, you know, like angels, you know. But if you really read the Bible, it says that God is going to raise our body and give it back to us as a better body. Same body, but with, uh, as an imperishable body that cannot be destroyed. And then he's going to bring us into the same world. 
Same world. But he's going to purify it, cleanse it, renew it, so that there'll be new heaven and new earth. See, we're not going to go anywhere from the earth. So we need to quit calling the earth bad. And always wait to just get away from the earth. If you go also, he's going to bring us right back here and establish us here after he gets rid of all the blemishes on this earth that came as a result of sin and so on. Finally, let me just read one verse and close in Psalm 65, verse 9 and 10. You visit the earth and water it. I mean, you means he's talking about God. You greatly enrich it. See, God is still doing his gardener job. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. God is interested in how your fields where you grow things are doing. He's interested in it getting enough water. He's interested in having things grow there, the grain that is growing there. And it says, you water its ridges abundantly and settle its furrows. You make it soft with showers and bless it with growth. And it goes on that you crown the year with your goodness. Your paths drip with abundance. And what is it all about? It's talking about earthly work where a farmer is attending to his work, watering the garden, preparing the earth to plant his seed and to receive a great harvest. And God is involved with him in this great effort. God blesses him, pours his rain in season and helps the thing to grow and flourish and creates abundance out of it. God is interested. Now, how can you ever think that God is not interested in your job? Some people think God is only interested in you when you sit with the Bible and read the Bible and pray, you know. He's interested in you when you are at your work and you have struggles at your work. Just like when it's not raining and when things are not working out well. When you are at work and nothing is working out, God is interested in making everything work out. God is looking to help you. God says, I will command a blessing. Why a blessing is needed? Blessing is a power. What kind of power? Power to change things. God says, I will command a blessing upon your work so that things that don't work will work. You can change things. So I am telling you, my friend, God is interested in your work. Your work, as far as God is concerned, God thinks your work is very important. You are doing something as a representative of God. You are doing God's work. Now here it talks about God preparing the earth, making it grow and watering it and all that. If you read John chapter 16, verse 8, there you read about how the same God convicts the sinner and draws him to Christ and convinces the sinner about the coming judgment and all that and drawing people to Christ. The, this God is doing two things. One is watering the, the, watering the garden, causing the fields to grow the grain well. He's interested in that. And at the same time, he's interested in the souls, in the salvation of people that don't know Christ, that are lost. He's convicting, convincing the sinner to be. See, to God, he doesn't divide the spiritual and the material. He says, that's not important. Let him starve. If food doesn't come, it's fine. No, that is material. That is bad or that is less. No, no, no. He, God doesn't do things like that. God says, I'll make it work. I will help him in that so that there is abundance. The paths drip with butter, literally. That's what it's talking about. Nayai polyhirid in Tamil, it comes. <laughs> Such prosperity he causes in that man's work, it's important to God. And here, on the other hand, he brings conviction, convincing the sinner to come to Christ because he's interested in the soul. I tell you, God is interested in spiritual and material side of your life. Do not think work is a material thing and not important. Look at it as a godly thing and do it as unto God so that through your work, the image of God shines forth in this world. People say, be a testimony. Your work is a way that you can be a testimony before the world. The kind of products you produce, the kind of service you give, the kind of work you do is a testimony that there is a God who's a good God. Amen? <laughs>